some of you have been a Christian for years, but the first time any opposition comes your way, your faith is folds like a lawn chair. You're like, there is no God. Why? Right? She's cute but doesn't like you, and you're like, this is a sham, right? And you go, what's going on? What's going on is your faith is small. Good to see you guys. Welcome to Chick 2015. Okay, there you go. All right. Hey, my name is Ben Stewart. I'm from Texas, thus the howdy. Uh, but I know we got people here from as far as Alaska and Vancouver and everywhere else. And um, wherever you're from, I'm just so glad you're here, and I'm glad to be here with you. This is my first Chick conference. So uh, anybody else here, first Chick conference? Handful? All right. Cool. Well, I'm excited about what God has for us tonight. We're setting a foundation for the week. And let me tell you what I want to do. I want to read to you uh, a couple verses from 1 John chapter 3. So I'm going to read to you uh, from 1 John 3, starting in verse 1. So if you've got a Bible and want to turn there, you can read with me. If you don't, just listen. I'm going to read it over us. I'm going to pray. And then I'm going to jump into what I believe he has for us tonight. So 1 John Chapter 3, verse 1, says this. See what kind of love the Father has for us, that we should be called children of God. And so we are. The reason why the world does not know us is that it did not know Him. Beloved, we are God's children now. And what we will be has not yet appeared, but we know that when He appears, we shall be like Him, because we'll see Him as He is. And everyone who thus hopes in him purifies himself as he is pure. Everyone who makes a practice of sinning practices lawlessness. Sin is lawlessness. And you know he appeared in order to take away sins. And in him there is no sin. No one who abides in him keeps on sinning. No one who keeps on sinning has either seen him or knows him. Little children, let no one deceive you. Whoever practices righteousness is righteous as he is righteous. Whoever makes a practice of sinning is of the devil. For the devil's been sinning from the beginning. And the reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy the works of the devil. No one born of God makes a practice of sinning. For God's seed abides in him. And he cannot sin because he's been born of God. Let me pray for us. Well, Father, I want to thank you for these few minutes we have together around your word. And I just want to say thank you for every person in here, Lord. Thank you for the person that's been looking forward to this forever. They've had chick on their calendar forever and just couldn't wait to be in this moment. I just thank you that they're here. And I pray this weekend, Lord, would, or week would go past far beyond their expectations of what it is you have for them, God. And I thank you for the person that's here and they don't know what this is, they don't know what it's about, They've, this was not on their radar and they're not even sure if they're the kind of person who should be here. And wherever we land, God, in our understanding of you and experience of you, I just say thanks that we're here. And I ask you now, God, will you help us see what it is you want us to see about you and about us and how we intersect? And I pray, God, you would help us feel what you want us to feel. And Lord, I pray there'd be a change. I pray some lives would be changed tonight and we would never be the same. And, and I can't produce that, I can't. And so we're asking you too, God. And I just wanna ask you guys if you're willing to take a second and you ask him. Say, God, please teach me something right now. And then if you would, please pray for me, that the Lord would use me and I would be helpful to you. Well, Father, we love you. And we trust you. Use this time. And we pray that in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, through a unique set of circumstances, I've been able to spend quality time with Navy SEALs, which is interesting. Uh, yeah, because... Uh, 
they tell great stories because when they are at home training in the States, they do what I think a lot of us in this room would love to do on a daily basis. Uh, so while you were in math class learning the finer points of algebra, they were out in the field learning the finer points of how to fire a grenade launcher, right? Uh, while you were in the library studying history, they were in the jungle studying how to stalk a guy. Uh, I remember hanging out with a buddy after he had gotten back from drive fast school, and he was showing me how to take a vehicle up to 90 miles an hour and then make a 90 degree turn by using the handbrake. And I thought, good, I'll use that next time I'm late for church or whatever, right? But I remember one time I was hanging out with some of them after they had gotten back from one of their schools and they wanted to show me a video from the school. So we were in their living room, they said, hey, you gotta watch this video. And it was a video from their last training school called Halo School. Uh, Halo's an acronym. It stands for High Altitude, Low Opening. It's a parachuting school. And it's not just for Navy SEALs, it's for anybody in the military, but it's a pretty intense school. Like you spend maybe half a day in the classroom and then the second day they're pushing you out of airplanes. Which, no offense to them, that first video as it began, it, they just looked hilarious, right? Uh, because most of them looked terrified, and I'll never forget the first guy out of the plane, like, even if you've never been parachuting in your life, you kind of know that when you exit the aircraft, you want to sort of lean forward, you know, face the earth. First guy out of the plane just hits the air and just starts running. <laughs> and we're watching him and we're like, what is he doing? There's no traction up there, man, lean, right? And all the rest of them, they would open their mouths, which makes their cheeks flop like crazy, and they just look silly, right? And yet, with each successive jump, they would learn some new skill. They would learn how to turn their body at exact degrees. They'd learn how to tack at over 100 miles an hour. And as the video went on, they started to look less and less silly and more and more impressive. And so I remember by the end of the video, none of us in the room were laughing anymore. Because as we watched them board the plane for the last time, they weren't in the baby blue training outfits anymore. They were in dark colors, jungle greens, blacks. Had 60 pounds of gear strapped to them, including weapons. And when they got onto the plane, they did not look nervous. And when the signal was given, they jumped out and descended without hesitation. And as we watched these men descend to the earth, it hit me suddenly why none of us were laughing anymore as we watched this video because it dawned on us what these guys were doing. These weren't guys taking a parachuting class for fun. These were warriors preparing to insert behind enemy lines. High altitude, so the enemy can't hear the plane. Low opening, so you spend minimal amount of time in the air as an open target. And the reason they were descending to the earth was because they were warriors on a mission to rescue those in jeopardy and to wreak havoc upon those who oppress men. And I remember as I watched that video, the thought entered my mind, now that is Christmas. I don't know what comes to mind for you when you think about Christmas. I don't know if anyone ever asked you that question, what does Christmas mean to you? You get various answers from people. They go, it means family, or it means presents, or Jesus, but smaller, right? Like, I don't know what you say, but can I give you a one-word answer next time someone asks you that? Hey, what does Christmas mean to you? Can I give you a biblical answer that you can say when your aunt comes up and says, hey, what does Christmas mean to you? You can say, Christmas means destruction. <laughs> yeah, the reason for the season is destruction. And you'd be biblical in saying that. And you go, where are you getting that? I'm getting it from 1 John chapter 3, verse 8 that says the Son of God appeared for this purpose, to destroy the works of the devil. Jesus came to destroy something. The reason we celebrate Christmas is because God wanted something destroyed. And some of you hear that and you go, wait, what? What are you saying? Like, didn't Jesus come to save and didn't he come to heal and didn't he come to bring peace? Well, yes, but it makes sense if you think about it to save necessarily implies that there was something holding us captive. To bring peace implies that there was a prior state where there was no peace. And to heal means that there was a disease in us that had to be cut out. And liberation requires destruction. And if we're gonna get on board with the kind of shift God wants to make in our lives and what Jesus is about, we need to get our hearts and minds around the reality tonight that our God wants something destroyed. 
And you hear that and you go, okay, that raises some questions. Questions like, what did he come to destroy? And how did he do it? And how do we participate in that? One, what did he come to destroy? Well, the text says he came to destroy the works of the devil. And for me, I don't know if you feel this, I find it interesting when you watch all the movies that have come out lately that kind of have a spiritual metaphor to them, like Harry Potter or Lord of the Rings, they all depict a world that's at warfare. They do. And they're not the only thing. C.S. Lewis, that Oxford Don that converted to Christianity from atheism, wrote this. He said, the one thing that surprised me the most when I first read the New Testament seriously was how much it talked about a dark power in the universe. Christianity asserts that the world is at war. Now, I know some of us hear that and we go, the devil, like spiritual battle, like red jumpsuit horns, like really, Ben, like is that what you're bringing to shift? What are you doing, right? Well, if you have a hard time believing in like a spiritual darkness like that, you just got to come up with some other philosophy that can account for why something as beautiful as human beings will do the horrible things we do to each other. How do you account for Somalia? Over 300,000 murdered because warlords use starvation as a weapon. And you say, well, they lack education in Africa, Ben. When Oprah's done, it'll be fine. Well, how do you explain Nazi Germany? 11 million exterminated by one of the most educated nations of its day. You say, we've evolved since then. Well, how do you explain the millions killed by their own government in the 20th century? How do you explain the newspaper every day? How do you explain your own heart? Like how many times have we violated our own morality that you've done something that brought shame into you, that just violated your own sense of integrity and you said, I will not do that again. And then days later you look up and you go, why am I still doing this? And you go, what's wrong with me? What's wrong with us? If you don't believe there's something wrong here, go work in the nursery at your church. There's something wrong with those little people. I remember when I was in high school, I went and visited my Bible study leader, knocked on his door, he wasn't answering the door. Finally, I just opened it, and he was sitting there in his living room on his couch. I'm like, hello, I've been knocking. But he's just staring at his little son. And I walk in, and I'm like, Mark, hey, what, what's going on, buddy? And without even looking at me, he says, that child has known nothing but his mother's love. I said, I believe that. And he goes, no, you don't understand. He's seen no violence on TV. He's heard no harsh words in this house. None. I said, okay. And he said, today, his sister had a toy that he wanted, so he backhanded her across the face. And he said, humanity is evil. I said, you're right. There's something wrong with us. And the Bible will say there's a consciousness behind it. And he's working. Jesus called him the ruler of this world. Paul called him the God of this age. John said, we know that we are of God and the whole world lies in the power of this evil one. Ephesians 2 calls him the spirit that is even now at work in the sons of disobedience, which I always thought sounded like a bad band name. But it's talking about us. And he's working. And you go, what's his work? Well, verse eight says, the one who practices sin is of the devil, for the devil has sinned from the beginning. What is sin? Sin means there was a mark we were supposed to hit and we didn't hit it. There's something you and I were supposed to be and we're not it. And it says in verse four, everyone who practices sin practices lawlessness. Sin is lawlessness. Now, when you hear that, don't think law like God had a little list up there and he was like, did you just cuss? because I'm pretty sure there's no cussing rule, no heaven for you. Hey, what are you drinking over there? Put that down, no heaven for you. That's not what it's talking about. What the Bible's talking about is that God created all things to work in a certain way, that he worked the universe and governed it by laws that make sense. So there's physical laws. The earth rotates around the sun and spins on its axis so we get days and seasons and years and there's a wisdom to it. The book of Proverbs says by wisdom the foundations of the earth were laid. The way God made this world makes sense. And the book of Proverbs says of wisdom all her ways are peace. That word peace in Hebrew is the word shalom. 
And it doesn't just mean the absence of conflict. It means the presence of flourishing. And what that means is God created the world to work in a certain way and that when everything works as it should, everybody flourishes, everybody wins. So the rain falls, waters the ground, crops grow that feed us, we till the soil, there's a logic to it. And when all works as it should, there's shalom, everybody wins. And there's not just physical laws, there's emotional ones, relational ones. Men are supposed to cherish and value and encourage women. Women are meant to encourage and build up men. Parents are supposed to love their kids. And not just love them, but see the gifts God put in you and to nurture those gifts so they can be developed in you so that when you grow up, you can use the gifts God put in you to help us and serve us. And when everyone works as they should, everybody wins. That's the idea of shalom. That's how God built things to work. We all flourish together. And what this passage is saying is Satan came to upend all that. And God created humanity to rule over the earth and the animal realm And Satan came as an animal to deceive humanity, to rebel against God. He takes this perfect system and flips it upside down. And the passage says he's been doing it from the beginning. That from the very beginning with our first parents, Satan convinced them of a lie. That to really enjoy life, you have to run from the author of life. If you really want to get all there is out of life, you have to distance yourself from the author of life. And you got to go for your son. You do you. And they believed that mentality. They put their faith in it. And they said, I know God says go this way. I know God says do this. But if I grab the wheel, I can steer myself to a place where I can have some experiences that I think will be life enhancing. And they bought the same lie you hear all the time at your school. How many times have you invited somebody to church or you invited them here and they said something like, yeah, I know I should be into all that religious stuff, but I just want to have some fun first. You ever heard that? What's the assumption? Real fun is distant from God. That to enjoy life, there's a set of experiences I have to get a hold of. And if it means pushing him out of the way, I'm going to do it. And our first parents bought that. And it says they bit into that experience. They got what they wanted. But then they got something else they didn't expect. They got shame. They got shame. And too many of us know exactly what that feels like that you had something presented to you, and even though you knew God says speak this way, it'll feel good to tell that guy off this way. So God says use my mouth this way. I don't care, God, I'm gonna do this, and you went for it. Or God says I came up with sexuality, which was a great idea, and I came up with sex to be enjoyed this way, and we go, I hear what you're saying, God, but I wanna use it this way, so I don't care what you say, I'm going for mine. And how many of us have stepped into something, been a part of something, seen something, said, I wanna look at that, I wanna experience that, I wanna click on that, I wanna go there, I wanna participate in that, and we go for the experience we wanted. And then we wake up the next morning and we got something we didn't expect. We got shame along with it. And all of us, too many of us have known that cold place where you went to get enhanced by something and you feel like something got stripped away from you. That's the lie. And it's been like that from the beginning. And when God stepped back into the garden, he said, not just is your fellowship with me broken, he says, the ground's cursed because of you. The whole world's not gonna work right anymore. This whole system's broken. Relationships with men and women, they're not gonna work right anymore. This whole thing is busted. He said, everything is twisted by this, that first lie. And so every psycho that goes charging into a school with a gun and every weird and secure thing you said on the bus ride here to get attention, it all flows from this. We've all been a part of this. We've all been victims of people sinning against us. And we've all been perpetrators of doing it to others. We're part of something desperately sick, desperately sad, desperately broken, and we can't get us out. And unless someone comes to get us, we are in deep trouble. So I remember when I was a little kid, I used to go to my grandma's house uh, in the country, and she had a pool in her backyard that years ago had been emptied of water. 
emptied of pool water. Over the years, it had filled up with rainwater. And not just rainwater, but uh, grass and trees and snakes and frogs and all that kind of stuff, right? And when you're a little kid, like four years old, it's grass and snakes and all things evil, right? So help me out, young people. If you have a grandma that has a pool of evil in the backyard, what are you gonna do? You're gonna mess with it, right? You're gonna play on the edge of it. And that's what my brother and I would do. We would go see grandma, hey grandma, and we'd run in there and we'd get on the edge of the pool and just be like, I can't even stand it, it's so evil, right? And we would just play with it, right? Until one day we were fooling around and I slipped and I fell in. And I landed in there, a little four-year-old, and that's a dangerous place to be. There are real snakes in there. But in my imagination, it's snakes and everything evil in the universe. And so the first inclination in my heart is, I got to get out of here. So I remember I ran as hard as my little four-year-old legs would take me, and I just went for a leap to get out of the shallow end. And I didn't come anywhere close. Like, I don't know who dug out that pool, but that fool was motivated, right? And so I can't reach the edge on my own. And I remember my brother's looking down at me, and I'm looking up at him like, uh, and he's looking down like, because uh, he's only a year older. He can't help me. And I'm like, uh, 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 I realize I can't get out. So I did the only thing left for a four-year-old at that moment. I started crying. And I remember as I'm crying, I look up, and there in the midst of that crisis, I've, I've gotten myself into some things I can't get out. I looked through the slats of the fence and I saw a guy, probably around you senior's age, and I saw him right as he heard me crying. And he dropped whatever gardening tool he had that he was working with, and he just started to run. And I remember he got to that fence and he just put his hand on it and left it all in one motion. And I remember I was like, oh, okay, that's the coolest thing I've ever seen. <laughs> and he dove into that pool with me and he pulled me out. And I'll never forget, I remember standing there on the edge and him looking down at me and saying, are you okay, son? And I was in awe of the one who dove into the darkness to get me. Our first parents in Genesis 3, with the stench of their sin still on them, God comes to them. And what does he do? Does he come with a list of rules? Say, hey, I'm gonna leave for about a millennia. When I get back, I better see some shalom in here. Is that what he does? No, what does he do? He looks at the serpent and he says, I'm gonna put enmity, that is hatred, between you and this woman, between your seed and hers. And then God does something very interesting. He calls the seed of the woman by a singular male pronoun. He will crush your head. He says, there's a boy that's coming that's gonna be the seed of a woman which is a very weird thing to call a boy because women don't have seed. And I don't have time to get into that. If you have questions, you can ask your youth pastor later. <laughs> He'd love to discuss that. But he says there's a boy coming, uniquely born of a woman, and then listen to what he says, and he will crush the head of the serpent. God's solution to our sin and the shame that we feel, the dark, sad things in us we don't want to talk about in rooms like this. God's solution to your shame and your sin is not to work harder or try harder. His solution is a savior. And he sent him sending into the darkness. How? To destroy the works of the devil. How did he do it? It says in our text, by his appearing. Jesus' appearance on this earth was a landed invasion. That's why in the Gospels you get Luke. And Luke's all upbeat. Everybody's singing. Angels are singing. Mary is singing. Elizabeth's singing. I'm pregnant. I'm pregnant too. It's like a musical. <laughs> but then you get the Gospel of Matthew where the arrival of Jesus is not to singing, it's to the weeping of mothers over their slaughtered babies because Herod is terrified of this man that's arrived on this earth and wants to eradicate him. You see, Jesus steps into a war. You see the inauguration of his ministry. What happens? He gets baptized, comes up, God identifies him, that's my son. What's the very next thing that happens? The devil comes to tempt him. Out in the wilderness is trying to derail him from his mission, do you remember that? trying to get him to entice him with all this stuff, and Jesus is fending him off with Deuteronomy quotes. 
And finally, Satan in desperation says, I'll give you everything, everything. Just stop doing what you're here to do. And do you remember what Jesus said? He said, no thanks. It's a rough translation. It said, and then he went with the power of the Holy Spirit into his hometown in Nazareth. And in Luke 4, he walked into the synagogue. They handed him the scroll and he turned right to Isaiah 68. And he says, the spirit of the Lord is on me because he has anointed me to preach good news to the poor. And we know that. Jesus preached and he loved poor people. And then he said, and to proclaim release for the captives. I am here to break chains and set people free. And then he says, this is being fulfilled in your presence right now. And he stepped out to do damage on the kingdom of darkness. And he came up to a woman who had lost all of her dignity and sense of self-worth because of her sexual brokenness. And he gave her dignity back. He went to a man who had isolated himself from all his friendships because of his selfish decisions, and Jesus brought him community again. And Jesus starts beating back the darkness. And I love it. One of my favorite explanations Jesus gave of his own ministry, and if you're an evangelist, and I hope you are, try this sometime. Jesus was asked at one moment, what's your ministry about? And he tells a story. He says, picture a strong guy, fully armed, got a bunch of gear, no one will mess with him. And he says, then picture someone stronger who beats him up, strips him, and steals his things. That's me. So try that next time. When someone asks you, so what's Jesus about you? Jesus is like a massive dude that beats a guy and steals his stuff. That's my gospel. <laughs> Luke chapter 11. When a strong man fully armed guards his own house, his possessions are undisturbed. But when someone stronger than he attacks him and overpowers him, he takes away from him his armor on which he relies and distributes his plunder. Why do you think demons were screaming every time Jesus showed up in the room? They don't do that with you? Only person who screams when you walk into a room is if you got a new outfit. And they're like, ah, you look fantastic, right? That's it. Jesus walks into synagogues, religious places, and demons are screaming. Why? Because the stronger one's here. And some of you, let me tell you something. You didn't worship at all tonight, and you're maybe not even planning on worshiping all week because the truth is you're not excited about Jesus because in the realities, in the dark places, you feel bound up and you are locked up in your shame. And let me just tell you something. That thing that you feel like owns you, can I just whisper it to you tonight? The stronger one's here. The stronger one is here. My favorite was the legion of demons. And probably not many of us in here with one of those. And you remember when Jesus walks up to that scene? Do you remember what they said to him? They said, son of God, are you here to torment us before the appointed time? It's like they knew a whooping was coming, they just thought it was early. They were like, oh, man, there was a lot I wanted to do to this guy. <laughs> no. No, I'm changing things. Jesus sets his face like stone towards Jerusalem. Peter tells him, hey, messiahs don't go to crosses. And Jesus sees past Peter to the author of that statement and says, get behind me, Satan. I've got a mission. And he walks into the city, Jerusalem. And in John 12, when he arrived in the city, he said to his disciples, now the ruler of the world will be cast out. On the night he was betrayed, he says, the ruler of this world is judged. And Jesus broke the work of the devil. How did he do it? By perpetrating violence? No. By taking it upon himself. And the writer of Hebrews will say it this way, since the children partook of flesh and blood, he likewise partook of the same, that through death he might set free those he might render powerless, him who had power over death, that is the devil, and might set free those who through fear of death were subject to slavery all their lives. Jesus said, I will take all the consequences, all the anti-shalom, all the shame and brokenness of what you've done, I will let all of it land 
on me, and he buried it in the grave, and he died with it. But then the ground began to shake, and the stone was rolled away, and that perfect love could not be overcome. Now, death, where is your sting? Because our resurrected king has rendered you defeated. And Colossians 2 says, when he had disarmed the rulers and authorities, he made a public spectacle over them, triumphing over them in the cross. That word triumph is used three times in the New Testament about the work of Jesus on the cross. And the original audience would have known what that was. A triumph was an event, kind of like a parade. The reality was if our king had to go out to battle, let's say we were a village and some enemy army was attacking us, they could destroy our city. The king would go out to ride out against the enemy. And let's say a runner came back and said, our king's victorious. The city wouldn't go, oh, well, tell him congratulations. They would begin to prepare the city for the arrival of their hero. And meanwhile, the king wouldn't just come riding in with the gore of battle on him. He would put himself in his best outfit and then on the day of the triumph, when the city was ready, the king would ride in, sometimes on a white horse, sometimes on a chariot pulled by a white horse, and he would come riding down the main drag of the city and everyone would come out to meet him. And the way the triumph worked is everyone would gather to see the king arrive and he would ride out up front and then right behind the king, there was someone tied to the chariot. It was the enemy, the one who had tried to destroy us. And the king would be in all his pomp as the king. The enemy would be stripped naked because naked people tripping down the street look funny. That's why they would do it. It's kind of the dynamics of a triumph. And there was one other group in the triumph. You had the king victorious. You had his humiliated enemy made a public spectacle. And then behind him, there was a group of people. They would dress in white linen, bright and clean. And they were the people the king had set free. And they would carry censures of incense and they'd swing them. And the mentality behind that was, we want to fill this city and ourselves most of all with the aroma of our victorious king. 2 Corinthians 2. Thanks be to God who always leads us in triumph in Christ and manifests through us the sweet aroma of the knowledge of him in every place. See, that's the other way Jesus destroys the work of the devil. He did it in that space-time moment when he died on the cross, and he does it in one other moment, and it's the one that means the most to you tonight. It's when he appears in us, when he comes to us, captives of our sin, people shackled by our addictions, and says, no longer, son, I'm calling you to me now. No longer, daughter. That insecurity doesn't own you anymore. You're mine now. Jesus destroys the work of the devil on the cross, yes, but in the moment where he breaks into you and changes you. See, this week is about shift, and let me just break this down at the beginning on the first day. The first and most fundamental shift is not one you're going to make. It's the one God made for you. God is not looking for you to make some adjustments, to drink a little less, or smoke a little less, or read your Bible more. God sent Jesus careening into the darkness to shatter chains and to set up a new kingdom so that he could transfer us out of the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of the beloved son. The first shift that has to happen is not one you do in your lifestyle, it's one God does when he pulls you out of the darkness and brings you into the kingdom of the beloved son. That is critical night one. And not only does God change your location into his family, he changes your constitution. It says the son of God appeared to destroy the works of the devil and then no one born of God practices sin. Because his seed abides in him, he cannot sin because he's been born of God. It says not only are you called a Christian, God plants his seed in you. God constitutionally changes you. And it says then you not only are free from the penalty of sin, sin's power in your life is broken. The seed of God abides in you and we cannot keep on sinning because we've been born of God. Now I know some of us when we hear that, that makes us really nervous because you say the people born of God can't sin anymore? Uh, well, I, I'm a Christian. At least I thought I was two minutes ago. 
but I may have sinned today. Some of you are thinking, Ben, I may have sinned on the van ride here, possibly two, maybe three times, right? Is this passage teaching sinless perfection? No. There's two ways you know that. One is the verb in the passage is a present tense, which means a continuous active verb, meaning no one goes on sinning. No one progressively, actively, unrepentantly dives into sin once they came to know Jesus. Why? Because when he changes us, he changes what we want and what we desire. So we may sin for a night, for a week, for a month, but it breaks our hearts because the Christian cannot revel in what our king came to destroy. And so the reality is we struggle with sin, but we can't keep pursuing it. He's changed us. We want something more now. But you don't need to know Greek verb tenses to know that. You could just read the rest of 1 John. Where at the very beginning it says that he who says he's without sin is a liar, and the truth is not in him. So John says if you say you're without sin, you're lying, which is a sin. So if you're saying you're without sin, you're actually sinning, sinner. So nobody's perfect here. But what happens when God gets a hold of us, the penalty of sin is gone. We're in the family of God now. And the power of sin is broken. The seed of God is in us changing what we want, what we desire, and how we live. But it's a change that will move us with progress and with struggle. Two illustrations and I'm done. First illustration is of my yard. When I first bought my first house, the guy had moved away months ago, and so when I first bought the house, there was no alive grass in the front yard, not a single blade. That's not me being exa exaggerating. There was no alive grass on this yard at all, just dirt and weeds, millions of weeds. And when I mean weeds, I'm not like, is that a weed? It's more like, that's a weed? I mean, they were all bigger than me. They were robust. They were aggressive. It was terrifying how many weeds were in this yard. Right? Question, how did my neighbors know that a new resident had moved into that house? Because I took a weed eater. And I looked at those weeds and said, mm, look out, son, say my name, all right? And I went after them. <laughs> and I felt like I was a little man in a big coleslaw. It's just flying everywhere. It's kind of wet. It was all over me. And I'm just mowing down weeds. And I'm taking fertilizer and putting it down and spraying weed killer. And I'm going to war on that yard so that months later, guess what? There was more grass and there was less weeds. Now, there wasn't a ton of grass, okay? Let's just get your expectations right. It was like, look, some grass, right? And there were still a lot of weeds. So much so that if you drove by my house just for one moment in a day and saw how ugly it looked, you might go, huh, it looks like no one lives there. But you'd have been wrong! Because <laughs> you hadn't seen the progress over time. And sometimes in our circles, we'll see somebody do something really unholy. You'll make fun of that person. You'll be locked up in that addiction. You'll be insensitive. You'll be insecure. And we go, I don't know that that person's really a Christian. You be careful. In a one single shot moment, you don't know what God's doing in someone's life. But how do you know when God's got a hold of you? How do you know that the seed of God abides in you? How do you know a new resident has moved in because you see less weeds and more grass over time? God begins to make some shifts in you. You begin to change by his power and for his glory, but it will be a struggle. Last illustration. I have an image in my mind of a beach, the beach at Normandy during World War II, and if you've ever seen Saving Private Ryan, that's the image in my mind. Horrible, horrible battle, massive loss of life, bodies strewn across the beach, fierce battle raging. That's the picture in my mind. In a moment like that, in the midst of a war, there's two kinds of soldiers on that beach. One looks calm, peaceful. The other, looks agitated, nervous. 
One, totally serene, undisturbed. The other, struggling, wrestling, concerned. What's the difference? The peaceful one is dead. Because dead people don't jump when bombs go off next to them. Dead people don't duck when bullets go by. Dead people aren't even cognizant of the battle that rages around them because they're dead. It's the alive person that feels the battle. It's the alive person that's concerned about the war raging about them and the fear in their own heart. It's the alive person who struggles. Why close there for this reason? Some of you are struggling so much with sin in your life and the reality is that you struggle with that particular thing, that insecurity, that brokenness. It's so beaten up, some of you, that even in your weakest moments you say to yourself, how can I really be a Christian? How can I even be a Christian if I struggle with this? Can I say this to you as I close? The fact that you're struggling is one of your greatest assurances that you're alive. The dead don't struggle, but when God brings us to life, the penalty of sin is gone. The power of sin is broken. We don't have to obey it anymore, but a struggle ensues. We've been liberated by our king, and he's called us to go to war. He's made a shift in us forever and forever, and all who see him and know we will see him in purity and holiness forever purifies himself even as he is pure. So we progress through struggle, and my prayer for you is that you'd come to know him, the rescuing victorious king. And then as you step out into a dangerous and difficult world, that you would struggle well. Let me pray for us. Lord, I want to thank you that, God, you're honest with us about the world. We feel like something's wrong because something is wrong. Something wrong in the world today. And there's something wrong in us. Every human being is beautiful because we're in the image of God and all of us are broken. We're so far from what we should be. But thank you, God, into our darkness and into our shame came a savior. You sent a hero to live the perfect life we could not, die the death we deserved, to rescue us out of the kingdom of darkness, transfer us into the kingdom of the beloved son, that we could say, God is my father. I'm a beloved one not because I earned it, but because he dove in and got me. And God, I just believe there's people here tonight who need to say for the first time, I want that. If Jesus is rescuing people, rescue me. If Jesus is forgiving people, forgive me. If Jesus is healing people, heal me. If he's putting people on his team, give me the jersey, I wanna be his. And I just wanna encourage you, wherever you are, if that's you, you tell him right now. You tell him, say, if you're calling me, God, I wanna come, I'm yours. And you tell him that right now, saying, God, I want to belong to you. Rescue me. And then before this night's over, I want to beg you, tell your youth pastor, youth leader, tell him, hey, he was talking about me. And then for those of us in this room that know Jesus, I think there's so many of us that know him, and yet we're so bound up by sin that entangles Shame that steals our joy. Addictions that rob us of a sense of purpose and hope. And I'm just so tired of it. Thank you, God, that that's not the end of our story. There's no tragedies in the kingdom of God. All of our stories end in victory. And I just want to invite you, Christian, in the room, as the band's going to lead us in worship, I want to invite you even now, not to make promises to God of what you're going to fix, but even now, just say, God, you know what I struggle with. And just tell him, he already knows. Say, God, you know I brought this struggle with me. And yeah, maybe there's some shifts I need to make, some changes I need to make in my life. But on night one, let me just start by saying thank you. 
thank you that you've forgiven me of this sin. Thank you that I'm not owned by this sin. Thank you that the struggle's not the end of my story because the stronger one is here. And I just wanna challenge you even now to tell him that, even if you're still wrestling with some issue, yes, there are gonna be some conversations about it this week of how you can make changes, but tonight, just tell him, thank you, God, that hope is here because the stronger one is here. Thank you, God, that we're a community that sings. And we sing because we have a savior. We have a king who came for us and loved us, who grabbed us even when we were a long way off. Thank you, God, that we are the beloved ones now because of the heroic work of our King, Jesus.